Today, I'm really excited to have Adrian Spataru on the podcast. Adrian is the founder of cleanvoice.ai, a new AI company that allows podcasters to edit their podcasts in a mere matter of minutes. Adrian is an expert in machine learning and was a senior data scientist at the No Center, as well as an organizer for Machine Learning Graz. He is also a lecturer at the Graz University of Technology. It was really great to have Adrian on the podcast because you get to talk to somebody who has been on the forefront of some of the new advancements that we have in technology and see how they are using it in order to come up with new functionality to offer customers. So with that said, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, Adrian, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you on. And, you know, as this tradition with this podcast, the first question I wanted to ask you is, you know, you, you seemingly transitioned from academic pursuits to, to pursuing entrepreneurship. So what, what was the motivation behind that? Why, why did you decide to go into entrepreneurship? So I think there was a moment in my life where I was thinking about, you know, next steps in the future. And it was like this, either I will stay in academia, I'll go maybe get a well-paying job at one of those bank companies in Zurich, so in Switzerland, or mm. I'll do my own startup. And for me, it was quite easy question because like, I don't want to have a, to work like a slave anymore. And then, because, you know, financial freedom is like quite hard to achieve nowadays. And even if you get your 100K plus salary, it's it's like not enough to really build something worthwhile. Uh, so more, more specifically, what I'm trying to say is that there might be a chance that I could get financially stable if I do my own startup, where if I go the classical route, it wouldn't be gu guaranteed because you're never going to get paid for your value. Um, like to a certain extent, not anymore. So yeah, you can climb up the ranks, but there's a limit for that. And for me, entrepreneurship seemed like the only viable solution for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I totally echo that sentiment. Um, I, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, fan companies, tech companies pay a lot. But there's a reason they can pay that much. It's because the work you're doing, they're going to have some type of margin on top of it to, to, to you know, to be able to pay you that. Um, and so it totally makes sense. I think that's, the, that's, that's one of the appealing things for me, at least in entrepreneurship, is, of course, like, you know, creating a product and, and all that's great. But from a financial point of view, there is more risk, of course. But at the same time, what you put in, the value you put in, you get as much as you can get out. Uh, compared to something like working at a company. Yeah, I told I totally agree in that case. It's for me. It's like market decides the value. So in this particular case, I feel like okay, if I'm good, I'll get paid. If I'm not good, well, guess what? I I guess I was just purely disillusional. <laughs> well, I mean, worst come worst, you can always go back to uh, work at the company. It's not like they're going anywhere, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, funnily enough, um, I got offers for like CTOs positions and like, hey, you know, I'm just focus on my own style. It's not like I'm <laughs> building my own startup so I can jump to another startup as a CTO or something like that. So yeah. Right. But it's always good to have those options. So I, I guess that actually leads to my next question. Uh, and that's, you know, and, and you sort of got into this, but there's always so many options in order to do like in, that we can choose in tech. And that's the, that's the beauty, but somewhat it can also be a little bit of a hindrance because people can get confused. Like what do I do next? Uh, how do, how do, you know, how do I choose what to do next? And so I was wondering, like, in your opinion, based on your experiences, you know, how do you decide what to choose next? And, and, and where do your ideas come from for, for, for making that decision? Um, you mean from academic perspective or from a startup perspective? From, from either or, just like choosing what to do next with your time. So... I actually started this decision to start a company several years ago mm -hmm. and I had a lot of ideas which I want to pursue, but not all of them, actually all of them failed. <laughs> okay. And through every failing, I realized something which was wrong with the idea or me pursuing it, maybe my lack of skills and so on. But 
now when I pursue ideas, whatever it might be, um, when it comes from a business perspective, I only try to pursue ideas which are my own problems first and mm-hmm. can be done on a cheap. So you could say it could be done bootstrapped in order to validate the need for it. So just to be give more, I'll give one more example and then uh, about this startup and then I will give an example from our perspective. Mm-hmm. So I before Clean Voice, I had a different startup. It was called Bezier AI, um, like Bezier Curves from Vector Graphics. Mm-hmm. And it was basically like Dale, but for Vector Graphics. And this was two years ago. So there was no stable diffusion or any of that. So stable right. diffusion before it existed. Right. And I built the prototype. I And it took me, I think, almost a year because I w- was doing a lot of research on myself. So technically, I could have published it to a to a very good publication because there were a lot of new algorithms there. But the thing is, it was still, even though I had a working prototype and even Adobe approached me for like looking for a aqua hire, in the end, it was still a lot of effort because this is not a one person project. This is something which is a 10, 20 people project maybe because it's a lot of, experiments which has to be done a lot of optimizations just too much work for a single person Mm -hmm. and i stopped pursuing that in the end because yeah it's not something you can do alone and yeah sure you could build a team but you need good ai people and i didn't knew anyone at that time who could support me in that with those skills right Mm. And yeah, and now I just pursue problems which are my own problems and ideally very small. One of them exactly clean voice, you could say, is that. And when it comes for skills, I generally went, so I went bright, wide in the beginning. And mm-hmm. now after exploring everything, so IT security, first I was, I wanted to become a hacker actually when I was 12 years old. Then I figured out hacking is actually not that interesting. It's like, okay, it's cool, but not as in the movie. Mm -hmm. And later on, I tried all kinds of stuff and I built like a vast skill set of general, like, you know, web development and so on. And then AI, I just focused for the past eight years. And because like for me, it was, I should specialize in something because you paid more or less for your specialization if you want to get a job and then yeah. become a generalist on the side. I, I'm not sure who wrote, said this, but like this T level of expertise where like you brought in a lot of skills and then you have one skills where you're like very deep. I'm not sure exactly who said that, the T skill set, if you know. Yeah, and no, I does generally approach that as well. I see. Yeah, no, it, I, that's the first time I'm hearing of it, but it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, AI is a very good field to get specialized in, especially right now. Uh, yeah, you know, it feels like every day I'm reading a new paper or reading a new development in the AI community. So um, definitely, I think there's a lot of, and, 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 and I mean, the field is huge too. So there's a lot of room for development and, um, and a lot of opportunities as well. So that definitely makes a lot of sense. And I think it's really interesting to hear about how you shifted your mindset from working on some of the bigger ideas to more ideas that can be bootstrapped and can be done quicker. And I think that, that I, I think that's the beauty of software, especially that you can be able to do that, uh, because I think every good startup or every good company is able to pivot quickly. And and when when you when you have a smaller product, it's smaller in scope, you can do that a lot easier. But when you have something like you mentioned, a 10, 15 person effort, that's it's a lot becomes a lot harder, um, especially controlling that chaos if you do have to pivot or if you do make, need to make that decision. So. That makes a lot of sense, and, and it's really interesting to hear that. Right. So, yeah, but but let's get into it. So, you know, let's get into Clean Voice and, and talking about building Clean Voice. So, as context to our viewers, Clean Voice is a platform that easily allows podcasters to stop wasting hours editing, uh, editing arena sounds uh, from their podcast. So I know something for me is like, you know, when, when I'm editing my podcast, 
definitely having that is, is, you know, it's a lot of work to actually go through the whole podcast and edit it. So typically I'll do it on the shorts, but not as much on the podcast just because it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. But if there's something that, that it automated, 100% I would, I would, I would try doing it. And so I'll throw links in the bio for clean voice, but you know, you talked about uh, some of, some of your background in terms of, you know, going from academics to startups and, and, and briefly about startups as well, but specifically for clean voice, you know, what was the motivation behind starting it? So I had the idea of clean voice earlier because, but I didn't pursue it because I was focusing on busier on the time, on that time. Mm-hmm. And I started my own podcast during the COVID season. <laughs> so everybody was in home and didn't, <laughs> they had so much free time. And me and a friend of mine, as a good old friends, when they talk too much, they start thinking, realizing that they could re- they could record a podcast. Right. And we started recording a podcast about AI. And it was easy in the beginning because like recording was easy. Uh, making research about the latest AI developments was easy. And then we realized editing was a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, I, I, it, for one episode, it took like for our first two episodes it took me like three hours to edit them out and Mm -hmm. all i was doing is just removing those uhs and ams for a while (laughs) and yeah just removing the same thing over and over again it just takes the soul out of you it's just like just energy draining and i'm fine with doing rough cuts but doing like this tedious us every 10 seconds like because we don't have broadcast experience. We are like mm-hmm. just two nerds talking about AI. <laughs> we stutter every 10 seconds. So it's not like it, it, there was a solution for us. It, 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 we were a lost case from the beginning. Uh, so we needed editing. Now, I was editing that on the side while working on Bezier. And then I said, okay, um, I'll take a break from Bezier because this is way much too, too much effort for one person. Mm-hmm. And then I pursued Clean Voice because like... I wanted to make a tool which removes our filler words because I didn't want to do the editing over and over again. Because like as every engineer, you over-engineer everything what you do <laughs> in your life. And that was one of the things. Or automate, you could say. Right. And before building Clean Voice, I actually tried to see if there was any tool out there. Because why should I build a tool which already exists? Right. And it existed, right? It was called uh, Descript. But Descript, uh, just for people who are not familiar with Descript, which I doubt... Um, it's a tool which you can edit your audio or video via text. So you can have like a text editor for your podcast. So you can remove sentences and so on. Right. Anyway, I use that. I tried to use it first. But the problem is that if you if it, it doesn't transcribe your audio perfectly, it just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And since I, uh, I'm not a native English speaker, I don't have a perfect RP British accent, um, so, and especially for my co-host who, uh, he was a Ukrainian who you cannot understand like this. So yeah, <laughs> right. it's quite hard for this script to handle that. And yeah, and therefore it was useless for our use case. So I had to build my own AI. Right. Fortunately enough, we had like four hours of us and us. So there was a lot of AI data for that. And I built the prototype within like a weekend. Oh, wow. Okay. And it wasn't working well, just to be very clear. Yeah. Wow. We, we have a prototype. Okay, good. <laughs> if you have data, you can figure out to build an AI model, but it wasn't amazing. Like it, but it was okay. You know, it like it did, it saved a bit of time while right. editing and that was uh, good enough. And then afterwards I started going very deep with the research and then I had like a decent prototype within a month which could be more applicable for multiple people Mm -hmm. right that makes a lot of sense and i that sort of leads me to my to my next thought here that you know in order to find these moments and 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 clean the data so you mentioned like you know it was it was more of a smaller training set uh of just your own audio before uh but of course now you're probably trying to productize it so people like me and and other podcasters can use it in order to take our, our ums and buts so, like, how have you gone about sourcing this training data set for, for the general model? Because that's a lot more of a harder problem than a specific model for you, for your use case, right? 
there are a lot of open source data sets which can be used. Um, mm -hmm. So that's very practical in our use case. I think the, the thing is not easy at all, this question. I think for audio, there's a lot of open source data or like creative common data which you could use. But when it comes to our fields, like legal, well, you, you know, it's quite a hard. So <laughs> if you want to have tech startup in legal space, uh, it's like, yeah, you could do it. But a lot of the legal techs are behind like certain companies. And like, if you want to do, I don't know. Um, yeah, um, in, I won't go for examples, but just just like certain data is just very hard to acquire. Right. And this is something we should be aware of. Um, I can't, don't have a solution for that. So if you know from the get-go that the data is not available, then um, you, the only way is through a partnership or either buying that data or whatever our means are required to get that data legally. Right. That makes sense. So I don't have an easy answer for that. <laughs> no, that, and that's fair. I mean, that's that data. I mean, that's why so many of these AI companies focus on the data part, right? Because that's one of the hardest parts, not only the technical training of the model, but the mo the data that you're feeding into the model. Because if you have trash data going into the model, no matter how good your model is, it's not it's, it's, it's it can only work with what it has, right? And so that's definitely a very tough problem. But but things have changed a bit. So in there is this concept of in machine learning called representation learning. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the idea that you have a model which can represent your can, which can generate a representation of your data and that representation can be applied for multiple problems so either you want to do classification regression or any kind of a machine learning problem we assume that this representation is very expressive that it can allow you solve a lot of problems so um, when it comes for image classification for example you could, in the old days, you would need like 100,000 pictures of your thing you want to classify. Right. But now with very big models, I think like funda funda fundamental models mm -hmm. and like these big neural networks which are pre-changed on big data sets, you can easily fine-tune them with less data to have okay um, results. Sure, it wouldn't be state-of-the-art results in the beginning, but you can still have enough data to have a working prototype which you can iterate on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So data, yeah, it's it's it certainly depends of, of course on what exactly you want to solve. But a lot of business cases can be still solved with just already models which are out there, combining them in a smart way and with little data in order to validate it. Mm -hmm. So you, I think it's more a creativity thing. But of course, it depends on the problem, right? Because right. there's some hard walls around data, for sure. No, for sure. No, that, that's that's super interesting. I think I have to, I need to brush up on my ML a little bit more to to, to look into that more. Um, because you know, I've always always. I can give you one example. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it's a bit, this was a bit abstract. I think an an example could make this clearer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let me tell you about our company's ideas. Right. So, when I have ideas, I generally write them down. I have a list of like startup ideas or like just random ideas and I write them always down. And then when I feel like, oh, I want to pursue a um, startup idea or something like this, which it's currently not, but you know, in case I ever would need it, I would just tap in my big list of startup ideas and maybe take one which fits my needs the best. Right. And one of the, these ideas was um, something in direction of um, AI notes taking. So I am a person who lo use a lot of post-it notes, like, you know, like these things. Right. Here. Yeah. So, uh, and the problem is that I put them like they're on walls or on stuff like that. And sometimes when I have a breakthrough of like, okay, good. I formed my ideas and so on. I would like to bring it to the digital form. Mm -hmm. The problem is that that is me writing on the keyboard. And that's a lot of effort sometimes. And sometimes I just want to scan it and like the, somehow the AI would read the text or OCR it and then put it in a, uh, in a, in a text form, put an AI which can correct some grammar mistakes right. and then maybe summarize it with an AI. Well, this requires multiple technologies and a lot of these technologies, and maybe there's not that much training data on this, but you can still solve this problem without building an AI. Because first of all, you need 
a person algorithm which can detect post-it notes? Well, you can train that on your own. Yeah. You can you can put post-its on. You go, you know, in the city, take your phone, put take a very a stack of various post-it notes, right. write them in different styles with your text, and you can build your own data set. You know, mm-hmm. and then you have an mm-hmm. algorithm which can detect your uh, post-it notes, and then and maybe OCR it with some OCR algorithm, and then. Afterwards, when it comes for fixing text and like summarizing, well, I don't know, just use GPT-3 in the beginning before you have your own model. Right. So um, this is what I'm trying to say. It's like a lot of time you can find AI use cases by just combining simple stuff out there. Mm-hmm. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that's sort of also like we, we see a lot of models available on like, you know, Hugging Face and open source, other other open source databases. That are there uh, that are available, so you don't have to necessarily start from scratch either. They're already pre-trained to some degree, right? Correct. Um, yeah, f- uh, like few shot learning. Um, this the idea of like having several examples to make a prediction. Yeah, uh, can be very useful. In the right. Right. That makes a lot of sense, and I, I think, I, I mean, and then for me, like on, on a little bit of a tangent here, but related to this is that's the beauty of software right now, that you know, in a hardware capacity, you just you. You can you can you can you can you can make stuff, but you need those resources physically. But in a software capacity, almost most of the time, you you can find some type of groundwork to at least get started and start building on it. And anybody yeah. can do it. Um, and that's why we see so many different companies and so many different individuals from different backgrounds being able to make progress in the software world. So it's super exciting to see. Um, and I think we're definitely seeing that in the AI space right now as well. Um, like I mentioned with these open source databases, everybody's contributing to them. I know uh, Facebook, Google, they all contribute to Hugging Face. So it's, it, it, the availability of information and, and ex- accessibility to these models has never been greater. Yeah, in one, in one regard, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Mm, you know how, how I compared this AI phase? I, it reminds me of the app phase. Mm-hmm where someone could just make, build a to-do app or make millions from that. And I feel like this is how we're currently at. It's like, it's very easy to use now. There's like a small gold rush where you can profit, but then there will be some kind of model which is AGI-like, because I, I don't like the term AGI, but like oh, similar right. to that, has a po- opportunity to do that and then I think like most startups, including mine, will just be obsolete. I think it's just there's just a model which is so general and most likely owned by a certain corporation. Maybe there will be also an open source uh, initiative on the side, which kind of replaces, if not all AI, at least a lot of software out right. there. So it's a uh, it's like a race now where like we can use our models for easy stuff, but we should be aware that <laughs> at least on, on a theoretical perspective, building a algorithm which is better than chat GPT is already out there and more useful for complex use cases could be used right. already for those things. So we should be also aware that this is just a hype phase uh, to a certain 100%. extent. 100%. No, 100%. And, and that's super interesting how you mentioned there that in the future, there might just be an aid, like, you know, there might, somebody might just make a, like an actual AGI uh, that, that just replaces most of these companies. Um, but, you know, hopefully that's, I, I think that's going to be far in the future, right? That doesn't seem to be on the horizon, at least right now. I mean, all models are wrong. Some are useful, right? That's kind of what we say in machine learning. So in that particular case, maybe there is an algorithm, like technically a GPT-3 is just a model which predicts the next token, mm-hmm. right? There's no really deep understanding of the context, yet it's useful. Right. <laughs> so what? even though uh, like scale and some new architectures which can use like very like I'm not going to go now too deep because it's like also a bit speculation. What would be the best approach to build it? But there, in we already will have a lot of value if you ha- if you have an AI which interacts with the world and can r- remember short term and long term context. And if it's also multimodal, then you know that's already sounds like a recipe of something very powerful right. already that makes sense well even the, even with that today a lot of technologies in ai are still separate into different products 
at least right now. So I actually wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, so we sort of mentioned the hype phase right now, and I feel like you know a lot more of the flashy parts of AI, such as AI generated media and Chat GPT, are getting the headlines right now, uh, which is totally fine. I mean, it's great technology, of course. But I think what really excites me is is if you look at some of the other advancements in AI right now, there's a lot of new products that are not possible. Um, for example, Clean Voice is, is is one of those where, of course, like the underlying theory and technology has been there for a while, but to the level you guys can do it today, it's because some of the advancements that have come out recently that you can really hone in on it. And so when you when you think about AI from a product context, like what what excites you about that? Uh, about some of the advancements in AI and 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 some and and entrepreneurs like yourself putting uh, putting advancements in AI into new products. When I started with AI, if you read in machine learning paper. And if you wanted it, you had to implement it yourself, uh, which was very painful. And nowadays, every latest AI paper has its GitHub repository, which you can then use immediately and train it on, on your own data or adapt architecture to your needs. Uh, it's like it's become so easy. All of that hard work, all, like learning PyTorch to the perfection, uh, like all of that is not really needed anymore because you can just a lot of researchers are willing to give their um, models uh, out there for people to use them. And that I've, it really changes how you work nowadays because if there is like uh, some new investment, you can tr just try it out almost immediately right. for the most cases, which is a uh, very exciting times compared to, let's say, five years ago. So, uh, and for product development of like, obviously the advantage is that you have a model, let's say it has nothing to do, let's say with audio, maybe it's something in vision. And because there are some new advancements, which, which could also be helpful for our domain, you just use that. So it provides this weird place where you build a model and it was so initially built for another problem. And you can just use that for completely other domain. And this is uh, extremely exciting right. for sure. Uh, it just, and yeah, sure, it requires a bit of creativity, I guess. But I, I think it's just, yeah, figure out like, it's all data, man. It's just numbers, right? right? So <laughs> it should work. Yeah, right? for sure. And, and I think like what, what you mentioned there, not researchers aren't only willing to give their work up and, and make it open source. They're encouraged to do that now too. Um, you know, like you, if you look at, uh, for example, like Apple, for example, released, um, I, I think it was, I think it was something, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but they recently released an AI and AR framework, uh, some, something combining both of them and, and they open sourced it to the public, which, you know, a company like Apple, you would never really imagine would, would be like be the last person to contribute to open source repositories, but we're getting to a point where even the most reserved companies are doing so. So it's really interesting to see like what researchers are coming up with. And like in my own personal example, I, I recently started a side project um, and I was using Microsoft recently announced Volley, uh, which is their text to voice generator and, and, and basically lets you replicate human, uh, like the, the speaker's voice with very little context. And the next day, I, and I was trying to figure out like how to, because they hadn't released on GitHub yet. So I was trying to figure out how to implement it. And the next day I saw somebody made an open source implementation, unofficial open source Im implementation on GitHub. And I got to try it out and, and, and it worked. So it's a super exciting times and, and, and a lot of great stuff coming out. And, um, and like you mentioned, like for, for people who just want to build side projects or for entrepreneurs, you can really, like the span of two or three days versus having to build everything out yourself, you can have a whole full-fledged product uh, based around it now. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, just uh, thinking about startups which uses only GPT-3. I mean, like there are a lot of businesses out there which don't even do anything fancy. It's like, here, I have two prompts. Please give me $10 <laughs> per month. It's like, we'll do that. Well, I guess a lot of people, man, because it's a business. Uh, it's more about the customer and less about the AI technology. And there is like a bit of advantage in that because a lot of people can, who have at least some technical skills, they can build something which can provide value and your customer is willing to pay for it, even though technically they could replicate it 
more easy than ever before because it's not like they have to build an OAI model. No, they literally have to go to OpenAI or ChatGPT and write like write that tool prompt, which is maybe very easy right. to figure out, <laughs> and they're done, right? So, yes, yeah, for sure, an exciting times. But at the same time, it depends, like because. Even if you build like a startup idea very quickly, um, people, I feel like well, at least when it comes to the indie hacking community, they're just building tools without really thinking too much about the yeah. market. Like, are the people willing to pay for it or like the customer base? Um, and even if people are willing to pay for it, what is your um, uh, like go to market strategy? Um, what are your you know marketing and acquisition channels and so on like yeah it, it's just it's easy to get excited about technology itself but it still has to be fledged in the mm -hmm. product and because else it's not really a business at that point so we we still have to distinguish those two things mm -hmm. for sure for sure it makes a lot of sense and uh yeah to, to speaking to your first point um yeah I, I think that's the biggest thing like you know people have now started interfacing with ai like never before but it's still a big challenge, like knowing what prompt to properly put into GPT-3 is, is still a big issue. And so you might have more generalized models, but the issue with that is that interfacing with them is a, is a struggle. And so there's a lot of companies popping up right now that are just focusing on essentially making the prompt creation process as simple as possible to get the response you want back. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see which ones stick around. I'm not sure if there's too much room for many competitors. Uh, but of course, it depends on the use case of each product there. Uh, but it's, it's going to be super interesting to see that. And the second point you mentioned there. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it feels like a race to the bottom, more or less. Because um, it's like, especially when it comes to text generation and maybe later also image generation, it just feels like, yeah. I'm the cheapest, we're all the same. It's just be because if everybody is using the same algorithm as the basis, it is very hard to distinguish yourself from right. a competitor, right? So this is uh, also something you have to consider when building such a startup. Because it's if it's if it really took you just, okay, I go to OpenAI, I wrote a prompt. Well, guess what? That's not really defendable. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it sort of feels uh, a little bit like uh, when everybody's making their own altcoins with, uh, with the same, like uh, just forking. Uh, forking exactly. like uh, Bitcoin or, or Ethereum and just making an altcoin, it's like sure, but like why are people going to go to your coin, right? What's the what's the what's the reason why? So. But 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 baby Elon coin, <laughs> come on, isn't he cute? Yeah, there you go, baby. Uh, and and that's the thing, like you know, what? maybe for very specific use cases, like it, and this is like going a little bit on a tangent here, but like for example, if if you if you make an app specifically focused towards dog lovers. And you just keep querying GPT-3 or Dolly on, on like specifically on dogs and, and, and just like really hone in on it. Maybe there's some, maybe there's some market for that. Like who, who knows? And I don't, think, I don't know if you'll have that many competitors in the market who, who will focus on the specific niche. So maybe that's the way you differentiate yourself. I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but no, the second point you mentioned there is how entrepreneurship's a two-sided coin. Um, and I feel like especially, a, you know, from an engineer, from an engineering point of view, you know, we love to focus on the technical advancements and how do we make things faster, better, um, and, and more scalable. But, you know, we, we, we forget to think about the end customer. And, and that's part of the reason I decided to move into product management, because that's a side I find really fascinating, but I wasn't necessarily getting as an engineer. So I, I, I wanted to ask you about that uh, in, in terms of from, for, for uh, Clean Voice, you know, growth is an essential, an essential part for any company succeeding. So I was just wondering now that Clean Voice seems to be validated some to some degree with your MVP and and uh, and you know actually seeing some success with with cleaning out podcasts. Like, what are your thoughts when it comes to growth and showcasing the value to the market? So growth wasn't trivial for me in the beginning <clears throat> because the way I launched Clean Voice first is that. I just went to random Facebook groups related mm -hmm. to podcasting. And then I, I got my first customers. So <laughs> that was a very unscalable thing. Um, the thing is, I for the product is very easy to understand. Like if you go to the landing web page, 
a lot of people understood exactly the value. The, the value is very clearly defined. In, in, in So for me, it was more easier to approach customers to and to make a lot of acquisition channels work than compared to other products. So I, it's like I am blessed in that regard. And also, it's also helpful that you're also the customer of your product because you know who you're targeting, right? right. Podcasters. And um, you you can make certain personas based on that, which allows you to approach it more easily. The messaging is more trivial and easier in the messaging. Well, it's easier than know where to go and find your customers. Now, my biggest acquisition channel was actually um, my podcast name generator. So Clean Voice has various mm-hmm. free tools on their website. And one of the tools is a podcast name generator. You basically describe your podcast and then it will just spit you some suggestions for a podcast name. Maybe now a bit useless, but back to the, maybe before ChatGPT, definitely right. an exciting tool. Um, still it has traffic. So I guess people still don't want to, even they, they know about ChatGPT. I think they're just still their instinct yep. is to Google stuff, I guess. So I still have people to using it even now. And yeah, they're like by focusing on building like various free tools, which podcasters were re- needing besides mm-hmm. editing, uh, focusing on that, that really helped me to find then like sustainable growth and constant people, um, flow of people interested right. in no, that. Yes, sir. So it will, it's a more. So if you expected a more technical answer, I'm very sorry. To <laughs> no, no, that that's that's super unique, and I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure, like, uh, I, I think when I was looking for names for for this podcast, because I had one earlier that just the name sort of popped up, but this one I had to think a little bit more. But like, well, how do I name the podcast around you know the work I'm doing? So I'm I, who knows? I might have used your uh, podcast title generator. I just didn't know that it, you know that that you know, you were behind it. So that's definitely a very interesting acquisition funnel, but one that makes a lot of sense uh, because you're trying to find, the, the thing is like, it's all, your audience is also very specific, right? To podcasters. So finding those specific podcasters isn't necessarily a, a trivial a matter because like if it's general, if it's a general product, of course, you can just release it to anybody or that is, there's its own, you know, uh, there's a lot bigger of an audience, but when you're trying to specifically market to this, uh, smaller sect that you have to be very very um clear with it and and have a have a unique acquisition funnel so that that's super cool um so you mentioned like you have uh you you have a podcast title generator is there any other free tools on the on the website you've seen a lot of traffic on uh yeah recently the episode title generator i think that's something which is picking up traction now I, i mean the way I approach it, I, I just do some keyword research. I do find like something, mm-hmm. something generator. And uh, so basically one tip I got from an entrepreneur is like build something which people are searching for. Because uh, so I when I build like features also, OK, I get a lot of customer feedback. I think I don't have time to uh, I don't need to find other features because they are telling me spam me every day about <laughs> what I should build next. So that's that's a good problem to have. But before that, I would just uh, ser- try to build features which are people searching for. So one thing which people are always searching for is background noise remover. And I focus on building that then because if you see a lot of people, a lot of traffic searching for those keywords, well then, okay, I will try to right. build that tool, of course. And then after that, you can uh, build a page which would target those keywords. And I think it's I think it's a very good approach to be, like understand your customer problems. So okay, my customer has these problems. Try to solve those problems. And the way you prioritize them is based on okay, what is the most searched one. And so that will give you also some prioritization right. between those features from the pay. So and that's how I approach it. So I I either so in this particular case I was building generators because. Um, at least in my particular niche, there are keywords which you, you can like build a generator and you can rank relatively easily, you could say. Um, but yeah, I started from the problem of the customer. Here's all kind of the problems which I have. Okay, let's figure out what we could build which could solve those problems for my customer. So always the customer was right. the main thing <laughs> and not uh, 
anything else. These are just the byproducts. Right. Well, I mean, that's the that, based on everything I've read. That's the best way of going about it, right? Try to find a problem uh, before you before you look at the technology and the solution. Look for problems and try making uh, try making solutions for those problems. So that's a really unique way of finding out those problems. You know, just through keywords and just trying to see what people are searching up. And I, and I mean, the best thing is you have some level of validation there immediately. Because I think one of the issues with startups is that getting that validation for an idea can be a little bit tough, even if you're experiencing the problem. Uh, but when you have keywords or you have those key searches, you already have metrics that you can base it off of. Um, so, so definitely, I think that that's a really unique flow there. Um, and, and, and it makes a lot of sense. So it's cool to see the customer right there in the problem solving mindset right there. Well, Perfect. Well, it was great having you on the podcast, Adrian. I had a lot of fun getting to know about you, Clean Voice, and, and this, the machine learning community in general. Before I let you go, I have two last questions for you. So the first question is, is there a book that you recommend us checking out? I'll just give you a okay. random book because it's not random. It's one of the books which I've been reading. Um, I think in the first week when I was working on Clean Voice, it was it's called mm -hmm. the Tiny MBA. <laughs> is this tiny book here, and it's a book with various like quotes and just like things to keep keep you in the right mindset. Um, so it's called Tiny MBA from Alex. Uh, Hillman. I think I bought it from somewhere from Indie Hackers. There someone posted about it. Um, that's the book. But if you want a book about single, you know, solo entrepreneurship building, then The Company of One, that's a great book that really helped me in the beginning. When okay, perfect. Well, I haven't checked both those books out. So I'll definitely add it on the shelf and add it to my list. Uh, they both seem very interesting and, and up my alley. So I'll, I'll definitely give it a go. Um, and yeah, the last question I have is simply, you know, what are the next steps for you and, and Clean Voice? What can we look forward to? Well, we're going to see more AI tools in Clean Voice. Everything catered to your problem <laughs> and my problem. There are going to be more features <laughs> on that in the future. Okay, perfect. Well, if somebody wants to uh, find a podcast, uh, they want to name their podcast, they want to, uh, you know, make a, find a name for their episode and they want to get rid of the ums and buts of their episode, please feel free to go check out Clean Voice. As you can see, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a great product and, uh, and there's a lot of thought that goes on behind it. So um, please give it a go. But thank you once again, Adrian, for coming onto the podcast. Until next one, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.